Hi folks, Jay Patrick Lamar here. Sorry for the weird angle and setup here. It's not a uh, usual kind of video for me. Um, normally, I'm over on the Pop Pop Fizzle channel making videos with my wife, Heidi, um, but uh, this is not that kind of video. Um, my personal channel has never been an attempt to have a channel. It's been a holding place for me when I want to uh, share a video of my kids' show choir or something like that. I put it up to my channel as just a place to hold it. Um, I've never really done anything with it. Uh, I'm hoping to change all that in the future, but for now, um, Heidi and I have been taking a break from YouTube. If you're following our Pop Pop Fizzle channel, you know that we haven't put up a video there in a while. The reason for that is we finished a big move. We're planning another big move, and we just didn't see how we could keep putting out videos regularly given that schedule. Now, with what's going on in the world, um, even though we miss making videos for our channel, we can't really get back into it because she's a nurse. And as you well know, right now with what's going on in the world, um, with the virus that shall not be named, um, she's at work a lot. Um, a lot of people in the medical field are, as I'm sure you know. So anyway, we talked a bit about um, the future of our personal channel. And, uh, and we may share this video on our Pop Pop Fizzle channel as well, but uh, I, I mentioned to her that because people were stuck inside, because people were self-quarantined or uh, mandatorily quarantined, um, depending on where you live, mandatorily, not sure if that's a word. Anyway, um, because people are quarantined for a while, um, I see a lot of people kind of digging into their creativity to try to give people something of themselves to help pass the time, whether it's just to hang out on online live or, um, you know, so that they can see each other, FaceTime, whatever. Or um, I've seen people reading bedtime stories to children and uh, sharing some of their work um, that they do, whether it's art or whether it's writing or whatever it may be. So for me, because uh, the only other thing I do, aside from make fun videos with my wife, is I'm a writer. And so my thought was I would read to you one of my stories. We'll see how this goes. We'll see if anybody cares. Um, but really, it's just something for me to do uh, to keep myself from going crazy. But it's also something, hopefully, that will uh, benefit you. Um, if you're not somebody that likes to listen to a story being read to you and you need a copy, I'm actually going to make this story available for free download on my website. So I'll put that information down below. Um, you can have it digitally there. If you want a print copy, unfortunately the print copies do cost me to get my hands on. So um, this story is actually included in my book that's called Tales of the Evermore Volume 1. Uh, it includes a short story and a novella. The novella is what I'm getting ready to read you. The novella is called The Witches of Grey Folk and um, it is a young adult fantasy Parents, if you're concerned about your children and you're careful about what they read or don't read, I'd say this is appropriate for 7th grade through high school, something like that. It uh, shouldn't be a problem there. But of course, you're the parent, so uh, maybe you want to watch this first and see what you think. Um, that's really about it as far as disclaimers go. Of course, this work is my own. Um, <laughs> that's going to be pretty clear anyway. But um, yeah, this is just... I don't know. My hope for this is that we spend this time together. Um, you, you've got a big Texan in your room reading this story to you uh, right now or on your phone or wherever you are. And so maybe you feel a little less alone. And it gives me a chance to go back and look at a story that I haven't looked at in a while and read it to you. So here we are. The Witches of Grey Folk, Chapter 1. In Darkness Awakened. Last is first. First is last. Bound in futures, bound in past. One in many, many in one. Bound to shadow, bound to sun. The boy's head felt heavy as wrought iron as he struggled to regain a firm hold on consciousness. His hands were bound with strong cord, although of what material he was unable to guess. His mouth remained mercifully ungagged, but the foul scent thickening the air sought to strangle him in worse ways. The unfamiliar room was frigid and damp, and he had apparently occupied it long enough for the chill to seep into his bones. 
He was so intensely cold, his lungs struggled to draw breath. Near him, bound and unconscious, perhaps even dead for all the boy knew, lay a man he did not recognize. Large, muscular, and in the haze of a forced sleep, the man mumbled to himself. Though the room was quiet, with no light but that provided by the moon, as its tendrils slithered like otherworldly serpents through cracks in the rotting wood of boarded-up windows, the boy saw markings on the man's face and left arm. Detail was lost due to the slow spinning of the room, a sure sign to the boy that he had not sufficiently recovered his own faculties, but tattoos typically indicated alignment with a guild. Which guild, however, was always an important distinction, one the boy could not make in the portly lit room, at least not without going directly to the source. You there, the boy said, but the burly man did not stir. Instead, he seemed content to mumble, him, mumble to himself in some desperate conversation. You, he tried again, with the ink markings and mangy beard, wake up. Last is first. First is last. The boy's eyes scanned the room, but found no source for the whispered voices he heard. Bound in futures, bound in past. The voices were tender and feminine, yet came to him in a raging river of sound, their words tumbling over and about each other until they became an otherworldly cacophony. The boy could not say with any confidence whether it was a single voice or a chorus he heard, but the resonance of it was sweet. No, sweet wasn't an accurate description for the way the whispers fell to his ears. Commanding? Perhaps. No, no, uh, there was no harsh edge to the words and no urgency to the tone of their delivery. It was not some misplaced call to action. A seductive, that was the word, he decided. The soft voices slithered and slinked into his ears and caressed his mind. Everything within him wanted to close his eyes and surrender his will, to let the chanting lull him back into the deepest of sleeps. One in many, many in one, no, the boy muttered to himself as much as to the other voices. It's time to wake up now and greet the day. I have things to do, voices to silence. Bound to shadow, bound to sun. You there, he shouted at the man on the floor. Wake up! It took several minutes of shouting and cursing, minutes that also cleared the fog of the boy's thoughts, before the bound stranger began to stir and cough the chill from his lungs. Several more followed before the tattooed man was alert enough to speak. What in the seven hells is going on here, boy? he asked, pushing himself up into a kneeling position, a difficult task as his hands were bound behind him. Once he was upright, the boy could better see his tattoos. The man was a pirate. Had his markings not given it away, the pattern of brass beads threaded into his long, dark beard and mane surely would have. You're just a pirate, the boy said. You're just a boy, the man replied. Now answer my question. I'm not the first clue where we are, pirate. That's captain to you, boy -o. Nor do I know whose hospitality is so sorely lacking. I was hoping you might know, captain. Well, then we've both got the look of the mountain folk, the captain said, for we're both at the mercy of ignorance. I heard voices, the boy said. Feminine. Seductive. Well, then you had better dreams than I, the captain complained. Mine were bloody and damning, as sins of the past were preying on my mind like carrion birds. Well, I didn't dream them, the boy said, though I'm not entirely sure I heard them either. Say what you mean, boy -o. My head ain't recovered enough for translating the ambiguous and flowery speech of the highborn. I think perhaps there's magic at work, the boy said. Dark magic, if I had to guess. 
Their words may have been in my ears, but they were also in my mind, echoing and seeking purchase in my very thoughts. And what know you, a magic folk, young one? The captain inquired, a tone of suspicion slipping into his gruff voice. Enough to know the dark magics are not but trouble. Enough then to know we're in danger. Well, I ain't about to assume folks what tie me up, so aiming to make my world better, the captain replied. Where'd they nab you? Grey folk, the boy said. Though I don't remember my abduction. I had spent a day there, getting to know her streets and port, and then gave up some silver for a clean bed at an inn called the Bright Lady. Drifting to sleep there is the last thing I recall. You? Lathis, a port town in the east. My crew left seeking refreshment. My first went to negotiate a price for our wares, and I was left to keep watch. Y you fell asleep. <laughs> On watch? The, the captain of the ship? Never. I was taking stock of my supplies so as to know what I needed before we left port. I heard singing and thought... Well, I ain't rightly sure what I thought, for something put out my lights before I could rightly form it. Woke up to you screaming like a bleeding banshee. The boy sighed. You saw no one. Not a soul, the captain said. Do you have any enemies? The boy asked. More than I can rightly count, and I'm a decent hand at figuring numbers, the captain replied. You ain't in my trade without ruffling a few feathers or poaching more than your share of jobs. Anyone that would turn to magics to see an end to you? None that would dare, no, the captain said. The other guilds don't hire out to wizard folk and witches. Goes against their grain and rubs them wrong. And among the race of men, you'll not find much love for even the host, let alone the type of dark sorcerer you seem to me. Well, we must have something in common, the boy said. We were both alone when we were taken, and taken at night. That could mean our captor or captors weren't willing to risk kidnapping us when others might become involved, or perhaps they have some aversion to the light. Kidnappers ain't usually at work in the bright light of day, boyo, the captain pointed out. And as for enemies, what sort might you have made? That face of yours ain't yet seen a race's edge. I wasn't aware that trouble had age restrictions, the boy said with a grin. Let's just say I've not always earned my coin honestly and leave it at that. I'll assume a pirate isn't apt to judge. Have you tested your binding? the captain asked. Mine are tight as a widow's grip on her silver. Mine as well, the boy said. Have you anything on your person with which to cut them? They seem to have taken my blades. If I could feel the damn knot, though, I'd sure aim to loose them. I'm losing feeling in my fingertips. Turn your back toward me, the boy said. Let me have a look. The captain turned, which proved hard on his knees. There was nothing between them and the stone floor but his leather breeches and a few strands of mildewed straw. I see no knot, the boy said. The rope appears to be made of hair, blonde from the look of it, and braided tightly. It's strong, the captain said. Stronger than these old arms, anyway. How about you? Anything on you we could use? <sighs> of course, the boy said, after a long sigh. I have the entirety of the elven armies concealed upon my person. What a happy coincidence that our captors didn't find them hiding silently within my boots. Saints and stars, they've tossed me in the dungeon with the wee jester. What devils did I piss on to earn such a keep? Relax, the boy replied. My tongue sprouts barbs when I'm confronted with stupidity. Stupidity? Have a care, boyo. Oh, dimness, then? But here's a simple question, and a fine one. If I had something in my possession I could use to cut our bonds, why... In the name of the broken moon, would I be asking you to contribute? Well, I had not thought of that, the captain admitted. Strategy's ne'er been my mainsail. So I chose my first for the strategizing. Kept me out of a mess of trouble by my reckoning. And yet here you are, the boy said. 
Far from seeing safety, useless as the day is long. Hey, what in the name of saints and seagulls am I meant to do for you, Boyo? If I'd reckoned on spending my precious time sharing a brig with a beardless boy and him having more nerve than sense, mind you, I might have packed myself a lockpick or some such to assist in an extrication. I reckon, though, I must have lost my invitation to this here jubilee, so I've arrived, it seems, a tad unprepared. Besides, picking locks might well be a skill learned by younglings on Cadis, but not so aboard my boat. Pirates ain't the delicate, stealthy sort of criminal. The boy chuckled. One can't pick a lock that doesn't exist, Captain. We're bound, not shackled. Oh, and now he's on the giggles while my fingers lose their feeling, the captain grumped. I trade my ship right now for a grown man to conversate with. Hells, even a bearded lady would suffice. Whatever these bonds are forged from, the boy said, choosing to ignore the pirate's comments, they are more than mere rope, stronger than anything I've come across, and oh, believe me, I've come across quite a lot in my short time. How old are you, boyo? I celebrated the 15th anniversary of my birth in the spring, but let not my age be a sign of my capability, good captain. Were I not bound... You'd find I'm the proper sort of ally for trouble such as this. And what exactly have you wise into this trouble, boy, uh, that this old dog might needs know, eh? The boy looked him over. Old seems accurate. Old, yes, and I'll not make little of it. But teeth I have, and them sharp and rooted in proper. Come a need to draw blood and you'll find I'm a fair hand at the game myself. Good to know. The boy said. As for what I've gathered, only assumptions, for the moment, though well-founded. These courts are thin. The voices I heard, or rather how I heard them, suggest dark magics, which would also explain how such thin cords might be capable of binding a man of your um, girth. If dark magics are at play, and I truly believe they are, I'm not familiar enough with their nature to undo them. The spells and power at work, and I need you to remain calm at this bit, seem to be preventing me from using my own. I suspect our bonds are enchanted somehow. That may also be why it seems so hard to remain conscious, though it gets far worse when the voices come. Take a step or three back, Boyo. Yes? You mentioned your own uh, uh, power? The captain asked. Yes. Magic power? Yes. A wizard's power, you mean? The boy nodded. Seven hells, I'm cursed, the captain said, spitting on the stone floor between them for emphasis. A boy, and a touched one at that, thinking he's one of the blessed host, when even the most mucus-headed cave troll knows ain't not been a wizard born since my elders moved to the isles, and we guildsmen be long-lived folk. Nevertheless, I appear before you, the boy said. And if you and I can find a way to rid ourselves of these bonds, I can prove last is first. First is last. Tell me you hear them, Captain. Aye, Boyo. Bound in futures, bound in past. In your ears? Not only my ears, the Captain said. My head's a kettle, and their voice is the metal spoon scraping round its insides. One in many. Many in one. It's making me feel, uh... Stay awake, the boy ordered. Awake, damn you! The captain shook his head fiercely in an effort to clear his mind of the voices. Bound to shadow. Bound to sun. Captain! I'm with you, boyo, but my head ain't fit for more noises, so quit your shouting. Damnable magics ain't natural to go poking into folks' thoughts and the like. The boy sighed. What's it mean, anyhow? I haven't the foggiest, the boy admitted. It's not a spell, of that I'm certain. But it would take a sorceress or witch to project those voices into the mind. A powerful one, indeed, to project them past my natural defenses. Then again... Dark magics are not my strength. Good to know that, at least. I ain't no lover of the magics. 
Even the hoe striped my spine all sorts of queer. No offence, of course, in case you're truly what you claim. Oh, I am, the boy said. And that makes me a rarity, I think. The old men on the mountain already came sniffing. Perhaps they have competition. For your talents? the captain asked. They are considerable. I'll gladly take your word on that. You'll have no choice until you get me out of these accursed ropes. The ropes will remain. Three women appeared before them in an instant. There was no creaking of a door to announce their arrival, no swirl of dust around their feet to mark their passing. Where they had not been but a moment before, they simply and suddenly were. Captain, the boy said, greet our captors. Aye, with my boot, if given half a chance. You will remain. Beg to differ, lovelies, the boy said with a smirk. Lovely they were, these dark ladies, with skin pale and delicate as the petals of a moonflower. Each of the three was clad in white silk, fine and sheer. Their dark hair draped about their shoulders as though the breeze slipping through the cracks in the boarded windows was powerless to move even a single strand out of place. Slender and lithe, their every movement and gesture was made with a dancer's grace. What exactly can we help you with? the boy asked. A shawl, perhaps? It's a bit chilly to be dressed so... Oh, what's the word I'm searching for? You will both remain. Insufficiently. That's the word, wouldn't you agree, Captain? You'll not hear me asking for such lovelies to turn prudish on my behalf, the Captain said. But I'd lay a sizable wager. It isn't romance or comfort they've gone to such trouble to procure. More's the pity, the boy replied. Still, I'm not overly fond of dark magics. They lead to black lungs and leave an indelible stain on the teeth I hear. Now, uh, which one of you deliciously body witches is in charge, hmm? We are we. You are one. True, uh, but the good captain there is easily two and a quarter on his own. Now, who is the director of this overwrought production? We are we. Yes, I heard that bit. But let's say I wanted to file a proper complaint with management regarding the poor conditions of these accommodations. With whom would I address my grievances? I can guess if you'd rather. Statistically speaking, I don't dislike my odds. You are impossible. You are an anomaly. No longer seeking purchase in their minds, the women's words, uttered without any movement of their mouths, now fell only to their captive's ears. I've been called a great many things, the boy said. Most of them have been, well, unkind. But it's surely a first to have a witch, which ever one of you is truly in charge of your little triumvirate, call me an anomaly. Uh, truthfully, I'm not a little pleased with myself. We are not witches. We are we. You're frightfully boring is what you are. And honestly... I've no interest in speaking to a committee. If you require something of me, I'll need to speak with whomever is in charge. The three women were gone in the blink of an eye. No displacement of air marked their withdrawal. You're a slyin', the captain said. I reckon that means you'll not share your plan. Not yet. I need to leave my wager on the table and let it ride Luck's whim a bit longer. You're wagering with my life as well, the captain reminded. I'd rather not mount so dear a debt with another player holding my cards. Relax, the boy said. I'm a shrewd player. Now tell me what you saw. Describe the women. Beautiful, the captain said. Damn near enough to naked. Milky skin. Almost. Yes, go on. Almost too much to look at, they were. I found myself having to look away. Very perceptive. Now tell me the distinctives. How did the women differ from each other? Uh, the one closest to me had an inch of height over the other two. She also had a spot on the side of her neck, perhaps a freckle, mole. Uh, but the poor light made it impossible to tell. 
and the other two. The other one closer to you seemed younger somehow, despite her looking at me all sad-like, while the other two looked only at you. I'd wait till she ain't exactly in lockstep with her mother, too. The one that was standing in the middle had hair a shade darker than the others. If theirs was a uh, mahogany and damned if I can see much detail at all in here, then uh, hers was ebony. I reckon she's the oldest, too, considering how the other two let her do the parlaying. All three wore rings upon their left hands, the boy added, but the one in the center also wore an amulet of some sort, though I could not decipher whether it was ornamental or served their magics in some regard. Seems like they had need of you, the captain said, but I've not yet reckoned out any reason for me being here. What need have they of an old pirate a few seasons past his prime? A few? Be kind. If I knew the identity of our captors, I might have a guess as to why you were taken, the boy replied. As I do not, I dare not. The fact remains we need to get free of our bonds and put some distance between us and the half-naked nasties. Well, get me back to my ship and I'll give you all the distance the winds will muster. Which would suit you well, the boy said. But the prize I sought in Grey Folk has likely moved beyond my reach. My window of opportunity was sadly a small one. Grey Folk, the captain repeated. It's been turning round my knocking since you first mentioned it. Yes? What know you of Grey Folk? I recall, as a wee boy, oh, hearing tales of the Grey Folk. Dark tales of witchery and even cannibalism. Of the mad race that once settled this land before being driven out by men and host. They weren't human, the story went, but... Uh, Agents of the underneath come to sow chaos and discord. Demons, most likely, if you believe in such critters. Saints, the smell, the boy said. That sickening smell. You don't think cannibals? Perhaps, the captain said. But how can such creatures as these uh, resurface so near a town of men like grey folk without word getting around? You misunderstand the nature of evil, the boy said. The Gremlin rise, and we stamp them down. Trolls attack a village. We rally forces and drive them back house, kill them if we can. We see big bad evil coming, and we put the sword to it. You're only proving my point, boyo. Hardly. See, trolls, Gremlin, and the like may indeed have ill intent, but true evil? Well, that's a different beast altogether. Real evil doesn't call attention to itself. It thrives in subtlety. It's seductive. It does its best work in the quiet places, where it can fester and grow undisturbed. It's not a raging monster, though I suppose it sometimes can be, but most often its work is to influence and, and manipulate. Why show itself when it can get others to do its grim work? What are you saying, boy? I speak it clear. I'm saying evil of this sort prefers to convince you that it doesn't exist. It says to the trolls, Look at those evil men! It says to the men, Kill those evil trolls! It gives you so much to fear and war against that you pay no mind to the source of the very evil you've been raging against growing like a fungus all about you. And then one day you find no safe place to stand. It surrounds you and soon it will consume you. Like so much fertilizer... So they've been what? Hiding? Waiting? For years upon years? Perhaps. For what reason? What goal? Perhaps they had no purpose until someone gave it to them. Who can say? Then we've no hope, boy. There ain't no way of seeing our way past the unforeseeable. Don't weigh a wizard down with your own pathetic limitations, the boy said. I'll foresee what I damn well please. And if I can't win, I'll most certainly see to it that I don't lose. Ah, oh, you confound me, boyo, but saints be praised if you can see us out of this. When I get us out of this, I'll be the one to the praise. If you'd settled for gold, I can see it done. Favors can be worth more than gold, the boy said. Well, then you can name me a favor, providing we both live long enough for me to repay it. You say that now, but... 
you will give us what we seek. She appeared before them in an instant, the one the captain had deemed the oldest. She was alone, and her eyes contained a ferocity they had not previously possessed. Why, hello, dear, the boy said. I see I was correct to assume that you're in charge of your... What? Sisters? Lovers? Coven? We are we. And here you are. Alone. You will give us what we seek. What is it that you seek, Pat? How exactly might I be of service? You must end. I'm afraid I can't help you then. My kind doesn't die easily, and most certainly not without a fight. You must end. She seems to be a determined lass, the captain said, not willing to take no for an answer. Nonetheless, the boy said, I'm afraid I must decline. Thanks all the same. You must end before you are broken. Is this a thing, Captain? This speaking in vague generalities? I confess it's new to me, and I find it much more exasperating and off-putting than disconcerting. The boy gazed into the woman's eyes without a hint of fear. That is the point, yes, love? To instill dread with all this dramatic nonsense? Well, not... I'm afraid it takes more than a half-naked woman spouting riddles at me to make the hairs on my neck stand up. You will end before... You must stop talking to me like a damn fool and address me as your equal woman, or all you'll get from me is fire and ruin and your darkest legends turned into a children's song sung for giggles each year at the feasting. I will suffer your games no longer. The anger evident in the woman's expression was quite palpable and profound, though in truth the boy suspected she only wore the appearance of a mortal woman, and whatever spell altered his perception of her and the other two beings was responsible for making them difficult to look at with any scrutiny. Whether she was more likely to kill him straight away or begin carving strips of his flesh to consume with a bit of broth and starchy rice he could not predict but he silently asked the saints to move her toward the former. Surprisingly, she opted for a third choice and departed. Well, that was anticlimactic. I'm beginning to think you'll not be content until I've been turned into some sort of creature that'll make the gremlin look cuddly as kittens. The boy appraised the captain and chuckled. You're a bit of a coward. For a pirate, I mean. Pit me against a battalion of armed men, or a thousand gremlins, and you'll find no end to fear, the captain said. It's magic's what chills me, boyo, especially now that I've sussed out who those dread beauties are. Oh? There was a legend, the captain explained, about these sisters, the witches of Grey Folk. Like most legends, it had been passed down through so many storytellers, I... Had little reason to suspect it could be factual. Truth told, I, I paid so little attention to the old sailor what told it to me, I didn't even remember hearing it until now. And the story told me I had only two sisters, if I recall it well, but it was, it was said they were beautiful, and like the rest of their kind that had risen from the depths, preferred the flesh of men and owls to the flesh of beasts for their eating. When men rose up to put their kind to the steel, they vanished. The old sailor, though, he believed that they uh, were still roaming the forest near Greyfolk, and he would not let his travels carry him past that place. This sort of thing might have been helpful to know earlier, the boy said with disdain. How in the rungs of hell does one forget such a story? Oh, I lived a lot of years, boy. I heard myself lots of tales and legends, and most of the stuff a troll dung, the captain explained. Can't be expected to remember the whole lot of them. And plus, I've been known to drink inordinate amounts of the cheapest liquor my coin will buy, which, you know, ain't exactly kind in my memory. Any other helpful information? The boy asked. Or must we remain bound yet another day or two before more information works its way past the fat between your ears to enlighten me? Have a care. I fought tougher men for less. I'm not a man, the boy said. As you often remind me, I am, however, a wizard with no ties to the trusted and oh-so-neutered host. Threaten me at your own peril. 
It was the captain's turn to laugh, and the baritone of his voice reverberated through the stone room. To the boy, it sounded not unlike a cow in labor. Wizard you may be, boyo, the captain said, and of that you've yet to offer proof. Still, if wizard, then wizard junior, and even still untrained in the ways of the host. Besides, after a fashion, we're on the same side in this way, Layin. No reason I can suss out not to see it through together. You help me out of this without getting me an inside view of them ghoulish stomachs, and I'll be true to my word regarding your favor. Now we need us a plan, aside from hoping your manipulations will... Uh... Before the captain could complete his thought, the youngest of the witches appeared before them. Her visage denoted not murderous intent, as her sisters had, but curiosity. You are unique. Yes, the boy said. As are you, my dear. Unlike your sisters, you are a rare and singular beauty. We are we. That's what you say, he replied. But I beg to differ. We are we. Those are your sister's words. You are you. Your sisters rule you, yes. Tell you that you are one in thought, deed, and desire. The eldest reigns you into her will and convinces you that it's your own. We is always a lie, my lovely, and told by the one with all the power and control. You are you, and you, being every bit as unique as I, know this to be true. Yet you've been a slave for so long that we feel safer somehow, and you've lost the desire to embrace your uniqueness. She stared at him for a moment, and the boy was uncertain what thoughts lay behind her dark eyes. Were they a predator's eyes, focused on how best to rend the innards from its prey, or the eyes of a child pondering the wisdom of an elder? Your sister, he continued, thinks you incapable of making your own choices. She's weak, you see. Without you, she cannot hope to accomplish her goals. I wonder if she's even revealed to you exactly what those goals are. We are we. We are one. I'll bet this lot has worked this angle a great many times, the captain said, careful to address the boy without casting his eyes toward the witch. I'll bet the older one's always taking credit for successes and blaming every failure on the wee one. That's how it always was when I was a lad. My brothers would steal the praise for everything I worked hard to learn, but they'd throw me to my father's belt for whatever nonsense they taught me into what didn't pan out. Classic story, really, the boy said. Everyone with siblings knows the truth. The youngest always gets the worst of it. She wants to... We must consume the one. This one? The captain asked with a gulp. I believe she means me, the boy said. Why exactly am I the one? What sort of nonsense does that entail? We must consume the one before the many. So... I'm an appetizer. You are unique. Look who's talking. Do you have a name, love? She stared at him for a moment with the blankest of expressions. Then her eyes began to dart back and forth as she accessed some forgotten realm of memory. I was... am... Telana. Telana, the boy repeated as if its presence on his tongue was sweeter than wine. What a lovely name. Don't you agree, Captain? Aye, nearly as beautiful as the lady what owns it. Was that a hint of a blush on the witch's face, or a trick of the poor light? The boy could not be sure. Uh, Taylana, if your sisters are determined to eat me, or consume me, or what have you, the boy said, the fact that I remain as of yet uneaten suggests that your eldest sister... What was her name? Merava. It suggests that Merava wants something more than merely my death. I wonder what that might be. You are unique. I try. A metamorphosis is what we seek. I don't follow, the boy said. Captain? Not a word, boyo. A metamorphosis is what we seek. Repeating it is somewhat the opposite of helpful, Tilana. What exactly does it mean? What are your sisters hoping to become? 
Suddenly, the air in the damp room grew even colder, and Telana's siblings appeared flanking her. The eldest, Mariva, her displeasure apparent, held a curved dagger in her hand and stepped away from her sisters toward the captain. To his credit, no sign of worry flashed through the pirate's eyes. His gaze remained like steel, cold and hard. "'Listen to me carefully, Mariva," the boy said, casting his gaze to the other two sisters as if the eldest was no longer worthy of his whole attention. If Mariva was surprised that the boy had learned her name, it did not register in her sharp features. "'Any damage you might do the captain. I'll revisit upon you a thousandfold. He is not to be touched.' The captain nodded at the boy in thanks, but the boy paid him no mind. "'Do not mistake my comments for concern,' the boy continued. "'I do not know this man, nor do I care if he lives or dies. However, I strongly dislike you, and I'll happily take his safety as my cause if it pits me against you and your kind.' Mariva stepped closer to the captain and pressed the point of the curved blade against his chest. "'Your sisters deserve better than your leadership,' the boy said. "'Are they not your equals, Mariva? Do they not deserve a say in the evils you pursue? Should they not be given the freedom to avoid conflict with the likes of me? Are their lives not precious?' The boy looked up and met Tilana's gaze. I will deliver death for any harm Mariva causes the good captain, he said, and compliance with such deeds makes you as guilty in my eyes as if you'd carved his flesh yourself. Mariva, perhaps finding a hint of uncertainty in Tilana's eyes, dug the tip of the blade into the captain's chest. The cuts were shallow but painful, and the captain was determined to deny her the satisfaction that might come from his reaction. He remained still and stone-faced, as if merely a piece of wood that she had chosen to whittle, and thus devoid of any sense of pain. The sigil she carved into him was one unfamiliar to the boy. Telana, is this who you truly wish to be?' the boy asked. The youngest witch remained silent. "'They're afraid of you,' he said. It's the unique ones like us that set their knees to quivering. They like to control you, to own you, because you are no threat to them so long as you remain under their thumbs. Poor, poor girl, I was the one chance you might have had to free yourself from the slavery. But you've cast your lot. Your fate, I suppose, will be bound to theirs. He contemplated what thoughts might be at work behind the young woman's eyes, but found only mystery. His next words were spoken softly the voice of a suitor wooing his chaste beloved into temptation. Who knows what worlds we might have ruled together, sweet Telana, if Merava and the, the other one were not so steadfastly in our way. Surely they've told you of my power. Surely you know just whom you have bound in this place. Our vows would have cracked the world in two. We are we. You are you. They spoke once more in unison, except that now only two voices were heard. Telana had not taken her eyes off the boy. Is that true, Telana? the boy asked. We are we. As the witches repeated themselves, the room grew colder still. Ice began to crystallize on the skin of both captives. The captain, though wounded by Mariva's blade, stood strong and tall. If the cold chilled him to the core as it did the boy, he did not let it show. Once again, Telana's voice did not join the chant of her sisters. We are we. We are we. He is alone. He is unique. They're talking to you now, dear, the boy said. It appears you're no longer in the club. He must end before he is broken. Why must I die, Telana? Do they even bother to tell you? I'd wager you aren't privy to whatever bollocks prophecy or dream led Mariva to seek my death. Perhaps she saw me ending her long-lived days. Perhaps she saw you ruling with me at your side and simply cannot bear the thought of her pitiful little sister getting to reign in her stead. Perhaps she foresaw what became of my foolish heart the moment I laid eyes upon you. He must end before he is broken. 
He is unique. He is alone. We are we. Oh, do shut up. Show them, Taylana. Show them who you are. We are we. 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 The longer and louder her sisters chanted, the more pregnant with uncertainty Taylana seemed. The boy did not trust his ability to sway her to his side before that uncertainty gave birth to panic and flight. His fate and the captain's would be decided by the youngest witch whose soul, if she had ever truly possessed one, was likely as dark and twisted as Marava's. "'You've been there, lackey!' the boy shouted over the continued chanting. "'You've been there, stooge! Why should they hold the power, Telana? Why shouldn't you be the one to rule? You can take my hand, girl, and let them tremble. Let the whole world quake!' Merava made the first mistake. She moved toward the boy, her curved blade ready to strike. She moved with such speed, even the boy's keen eyes didn't see her approach until the knife struck some invisible barrier between them. The dagger glanced away from him, denied the blow the witch had hoped would end him. Telana made the second mistake. She spoke something in a dark, forgotten language, a spell that loosed the bonds on the boy and the wounded pirate. No sooner had she spoken, however, than her sisters cast a spell of their own that closed Telana's mouth. It was suddenly and entirely absent from her face, as if she had been born without it. In a blind panic, she lunged at Merava, and that was all the distraction that the boy needed. Motioning for a spell in the manner of the host, his gestures reached deep into the foundations of the world, supernaturally stirring the very power of creation. The captain saw what the boy was doing and moved to attack one of the sisters from behind, but the boy shot him a stern look and shook his head. By the time Merava turned her attention from her sister's ferocity to the boy and his spell, it was too late. The captives were gone, faded from sight, like the specters of old. That's it. Chapter one of The Witches of Greyfolk. My gift to you. I'll be back um, sometime later this week with uh, the second chapter, and I'll keep posting them um, until this story is done. Hopefully that'll be something that you can enjoy with family, with friends, whatever. Uh, Share it around to whoever you like. I will put the print version of this in ebook form um, available. um, I'll try to put the PDF up too in case you don't have an e-reader, but I'll try to put those up for download on my website. That's www.jpatricklamar.com. It's down here at the bottom of the screen. Um, If you'd like to purchase a copy of the book or donate to my Patreon, those links are here as well, uh, and you'll find those down in the description as well. Anyway, that's it for me, J. Patrick Lamar. Thank you so much for listening and giving me your time to do a bit of reading. I hope to see you back for Chapter 2 of The Witches of Greyfolk.